are going to hear first from Jacqueline Smitty, then from Yu, and then from Alex Mitchell. Thanks for coming, everyone. This is the first time we presented this talk, so we look forward to your feedback. Um, the talk is divided into three parts corresponding to the three aims of the talk. So first, I'm going to present a new puzzle about the visual appearance of shape. Uh, in the second part of the talk, Ying will provide some empirical background to motivate the puzzle. And in the third part of the talk, Alex will present some steps towards solving the puzzle. So first, on, the, on this new puzzle, uh, we hope it's new. It certainly puzzled us, and we think it's slightly different from a more familiar puzzle, um, which has a long history in philosophy. As Susanna Schellenberg noted, uh, it goes back at least to the British empiricists, and perhaps earlier. But our story starts with uh, Russell, um, and we will be obsessed with the humble table. Um, here is a quote from the first chapter of The Problems of Philosophy. Russell says, a given thing looks different in shape from every different point of view. If our table is really rectangular, it will look from almost all points of view as if it had two acute angles and two obtuse angles. If opposite sides are parallel, they will look as if they converge to a point away from the spectator. If they're of equal length, they will look as if the nearer side were longer, and so on. Now, we think Russell got a lot wrong. Uh, in particular, he thought you never see the real shape of the table, only what he calls its apparent shape. Indeed, Russell went further. He says, you never see the table. You only see a sense datum, which is a mental object that has exactly the properties it appears to have. We think all of that is wrong, but um, we think he got one thing right, which is that the appearance of a table differs depending on your perspective. Um, so here's a diagram from Stephen Palmer to illustrate the point. Palmer says, an ordinary square takes on a wide variety of different projected shapes at different perspectives, trapezoids, par parallelograms, rhombuses, and quadrilaterals. Um, we can think of projected shape or perspectival shape you can define that a bit more precisely as the shape that an object would project onto a vertical plane perpendicular to the line of sight. And this seems to be what Russell is talking about. So if you imagine that these squares are coffee tables, the idea is that um, how they appear to you will vary depending on your perspective. If you're looking from above, the table may appear square, but if you're looking at it from the side, it's likely to look non-square, for example, trapezoidal. And this gives rise to what we're calling the old puzzle. Um, so the puzzle is how we can reconcile variation and constancy in the visual appearance of, for example, shape. So when you walk around a square table, there's a variable aspect. That is, the appearance of the table changes as you walk around it. It looks square when viewed from above, but slightly trapezoidal when viewed from the side. The second point is that there's a constant element to the appearances. The table itself appears to remain unchanged as you walk around it. It doesn't appear to be changing in shape, deforming, for example. And so that gives rise to our puzzle. How can the table appear to remain unchanged when its appearance is changing? So we can formulate the puzzle a bit more precisely as a conflict between two desiderata. Here we're, we've been helped a lot by a, a review article by uh, Susanna Schellenberg and E.J. Green, so we're grateful to them. Uh, but on the one hand, there's the dual aspect desideratum, which says we should do justice to both aspects of visual appearance, uh, that is, its constant and its variable aspects. But on the other hand, uh, this is the consistency desideratum, we shouldn't impute inconsistent appearances just on the basis of changes in perspective. Okay. Now the problem is that these two desiderata are kind of in tension with each other. It's very hard to do justice to both aspects of visual appearance without violating the consistency desiderata. So here's a more careful formulation of the puzzle that brings that point out. And as is typical in philosophy, we'll try to formulate the puzzle as an inconsistent set of claims, each of which has some uh, initial plausibility. Uh, so the first claim is that the table looks square um, when viewed from directly above, for example. Uh, in fact, when viewed from any angle, it looks, it looks to be square. 
Um, but the table also looks somehow non-square when viewed from an angle. For example, it looks trapezoidal, and yet there's no inconsistent appearance. Nothing looks both square and non-square at once. Just a little comment on inconsistent appearances. Uh, as Susanna mentioned, we have inconsistent beliefs. It may be that we even sometimes have inconsistent appearances. Perhaps when you look at the waterfall illusion, you see the same thing as moving and not moving. But we just think it's rather implausible that you have those kinds of strange appearances whenever you walk around a table. Okay, So that is the old puzzle, and it's puzzling because if you reject one of those claims to avoid inconsistency, you violate one of our desiderata. So if you reject the first claim as Russell did, and you deny that the table looks square, then you haven't really done justice to the variable aspects in, um, uh, sorry, the constant aspects in perceptual experience. If you deny the second claim, as for example Christopher Peacock does, you deny that the table looks in any sense trapezoidal, then it's hard to see how you do justice to the variable aspects in perceptual experience. But if you said the table looks both square and non-square, then you violate the consistency desideratum. So we're in a bit of a bind here. Now the most popular solution in the current literature to this old puzzle is uh, the dual content view. Uh, and this has been defended by Michael Tai, Alvin Noe, and Susanna Schellenberg, among others. Um, so this is a rather neat solution to the puzzle. So the, the view says we experience two kinds of properties. On the one hand, there are intrinsic properties, for example, the intrinsic shape of the table, which appears to remain unchanged as your perspective changes. So that could be square, for example. Um, then there are perspectival properties. For example, the perspectival shape of the table, which appears to change as your perspective changes. Now, treatments of these perspectival properties do vary, um, depending on the proponent of the uh, dual content view. But the basic idea, the neat idea here, is that we can do justice to both aspects of visual appearance, its variable and its constant elements, without imputing any inconsistency to appearance. So the idea is a table can retain its intrinsic shape, uh, unchanging in its intrinsic shape, while nevertheless changing in its relational uh, shape properties, its perspectival shape. Um, the point is that objects just have both kinds of properties. They also appear to have both kinds of properties. And so in the best cases, appearance matches reality, and there's no illusion, contrary to what uh, many have thought. But this gives rise to a question. Is there illusion? Um, does the visual system achieve full constancy? Well, to say that it does achieve full constancy is to say that there's a perfect match between appearance and reality with respect to intrinsic properties on the one hand or perspectival properties on the other hand. So if you just look at this diagram, this is uh, again a diagram from Palmer for perceived size, true constancy suggests that the apparent size of the object matches the true size of the object. But if there's under constancy, as we think, um, then as the object is further away from, uh, from the perceiver, um, its size is, is underestimated. There's some distortion towards the retinal size of the object. So we want to raise two challenges for the dual content theory. Now, just to be clear, we actually think that these are not fatal challenges to the dual content theory, but rather to certain simple versions that have been proposed by, for example, Alvin Noe in a defense of uh, relational theories of perception. So very important to him that we really get things right. Not clear to me that that's so important for Susanna's uh, picture, but, but we could talk more about that. Um, so one challenge is that there's some distortion in the appearance of perspectival shape, some mismatch between the appearance and the reality with respect to perspectival shape. And more specifically, we think here there's some regression towards the real. That is, we tend to overestimate the perspectival shape, to think it's closer than the real, to the real shape than it really is. That challenge is less important for our purposes than the second challenge, which says there's some distortion in the appearance of intrinsic shape, some regression towards the retinal. These phrases about regression are taken from uh, Thulis uh, and Brunswick, uh, classic um, experimental psychologists of the, of the 19th century. Um, so here is a diagram to illustrate the point that we're currently making. So on the left hand, you have a traditional version of the dual content theory as defended by, for example, Alvin Noe. Now, uh, to explain this diagram, the circles represent properties. 
The crosses represent how those properties appear to us. The blue circles represent intrinsic properties. The red properties represent perspectival properties. So what you see in the picture on the left is that there's a perfect match between the properties as they really are and the properties as they appear to be, both at the level of intrinsic properties and at the level of intrinsic properties. That's what we take to be more or less uh, Alvanoe's view. The first challenge uh, concerns these perspectival properties, and it says, no, there's a mismatch here between appearance and reality, and a bit more specifically, there's a distortion in the direction of real size. So that's why the red crosses are sort of intermediate between the um, perspectival size or shape and the real intrinsic size or shape of the object. More germane for our purposes is the second challenge, which says there's some distortion in the appearance of intrinsic properties. And in particular, there's some regression towards the retinal. That's why the blue crosses are intermediate between the real size and the perspectival size, but a little bit closer to real than retinal. And here's the really important thing to note for our purposes. As your viewpoint changes, as you move from view one to view two, there's a variation we claim not only in the appearance of perspectival properties, but also in the appearance of intrinsic properties. That's why we have the two blue crosses. That's a rather abstract description of our point, but here's an intuitive example um, that will make things vivid. When you walk around a square table, there's a variable aspect to your experience. Um, there's a change in the apparent shape of the table. So when viewed from above, perhaps the table looks perfectly square. But our claim is, when viewed from the side at a distance, you represent this, the table as slightly squished in depth, so that it appears very slightly wider than it is deep. And so when viewed from another side, it looks squished in a different dimension. And yet, there's also a constant element to the appearance. The shape of the table doesn't appear to change as you walk around it. It appears to remain rigid. It doesn't appear to be deforming in shape. So our new puzzle, we think this is slightly different from the old puzzle, is to explain how the table can appear to remain rigid when there's a change in its apparent shape. So again, this puzzle can be formulated as an inconsistent set of claims. Um, first, the table appears square at T1 as you view it from above. Uh, second, the table appears non-square at T2 as you view it from the side. But third, if the table appears square at T1 and non-square at T2, then it appears to sh change shape between T1 and T2. But it doesn't. It appears to remain rigid between T1 and T2, and yet there are no inconsistent appearances. The table doesn't appear both to change shape and to, re to remain rigid between T1 and T2. Okay. So again, you can think of this puzzle as a tension between conflicting desiderata. Um, claims 1 and 2 correspond to um, variation. That's the variable aspect in experience. Claim 4 corresponds to the constant element in experience. So if you reject any of those claims, one, two, and four, then we think you're not doing justice to both aspects of experience. You're violating the dual aspect desideratum. If you reject five, then you're violating the consistency desideratum. You're imputing inconsistent appearances to the, visual, to the poor old visual system. Um, that leaves the third claim, which is needed to generate the inconsistency. And this is a principle that says, in effect, that a change in appearance generates an appearance of change. And just to put our cards on the table, that's the principle that we'll reject in the third part of the talk. Um, but my goal here is not so much to present our solution as to explain why the puzzles are different. And so this table will hopefully make the point. The two puzzles have the same abstract structure. They're both puzzles about how to reconcile constant and variable aspects in, a, in the visual appearance of shape but without imputing inconsistent appearances. The difference is that we're talking about different constant and variable aspects in each case. The old puzzle concerns levels one and two. So there's um, change or variation in the appearance of perspectival shape, but no change, constancy, in the appearance of intrinsic shape. And so the old, old puzzle concerns how we should reconcile those two claims. The new puzzle, in contrast, concerns the conflict between level two and level three. 
crucially, if you look at the second uh, row, you see that we think there is change in the appearance of intrinsic shape. That's the claim that we take to be motivated by the empirical data. That's the claim about the distortion, uh, distortions in the appearance of intrinsic shape. Our puzzle then is to explain how there can be a change in the appearance of intrinsic shape with no appearance of change in intrinsic shape. So just to summarize the contrast before I hand over. Um, the new puzzle concerns only intrinsic properties, not perspectival properties. So you can't solve this puzzle, you can't solve this puzzle at least, by introducing a distinction between appearance of intrinsic and pers perspectival properties. Some other solution is needed. Um, the second point is that this new puzzle arises only because vision fails to achieve um, full constancy. If Contrary to fact, the visual system achieved full constancy, we wouldn't face the new puzzle. Um, although I think we would still face some version of the old puzzle. That again shows how the two puzzles are different. And perhaps the key point to emphasize, this new puzzle is based on empirical evidence rather than introspection. We need empirical evidence that the visual system fails to achieve full constancy. Uh, that's really the goal of the second part of the talk. So this is a, a good point for me to hand over to, to you. Now, yeah, you will need to. All right. Thanks, Declan. Um, so, my part of the talk is to um, introduce you some of the empirical evidence showing the systematic distortion of visual space with a main focus on um, a particular type of misrepresentation, which is this distance-dependent compression of apparent depth. So what that is, I'll explain it in a few minutes. So I will start by um, reviewing some of the published data in this area, um, and then um, present some, a series of um, um, psychophysical studies done in our vision lab. And all these studies were done with close collaboration with Professor Jim Todd, um, whose expertise and um, tremendously helpful advices contribute a lot to this project. So big thanks to Jim. Um, all right. So people tend to think that we see things as they really are in the world, um, but there is uh, overwhelming empirical evidence suggests that it is not the case. Instead, um, the visual, the space properties in particular, the intrinsic shape properties are misrepresented. And more importantly, these misrepresentations are widespread. They are everywhere in our daily life. Okay, so to see this idea, let's do a simple test together, okay? So here is a horizontal line and the four vertical lines. So tell me which vertical line do you think looks like to have the same length of this horizontal line? All right, so how many of you think it's A? Show me your hands. Excellent, <laughs> thank you. What about B? Thank you. Um, is there any C? Okay, cool. <laughs> what about D? Thank you. Well, let's measure it. <laughs> okay, I have this magic dick here. Um, so, I, if I match my stick to this horizontal line, it's about um, this length, okay? And then I'll move my stick here. As I rotate it and translate it, its physical length doesn't change, right? Okay, so as you can see, A doesn't match, B doesn't match, ooh, it's C, congratulations guys, and D doesn't match, okay? All right, so the correct answer should be C, and as you see, um, at least more than half of the audience in this room misrepresented to the length. And um, this um, is consistent with the classic um, finding of this vertical and horizontal illusion, right? But even more, if we show this bunch of lines to people um, with not only this horizontal and the vertical line, but contains the various um, orientations in this frontal parallel plan, and they appear differently to people depending on their orientations, um, according to this um, study done by Purvis and many other researchers. 
Okay. So if you think about it, this result is quite remarkable given how often we see these line segments in our daily life, right? So this powerful and straightforward um, example clearly demonstrates um, the idea of our cautious claim, which is that the misrepresentations are widespread, right? Um, but note that the, the, this cautious claim is only about the existence of the misrepresentations. But when it t comes to the particular form of the representation, a misrepresentation, well, it can take various forms depending on um, the specific stimulus and the varying conditions. Okay? So next, we'll only focus on one particular form of this misrepresentation, which is this distance-dependent compression of apparent depth. Okay? So it has two aspects here. Um, first, the in-depth interval appears to be compressed relative to the frontal interval. And second, the degree of this compression increase as uh, the viewing distance increases. Okay? And we call this, uh, call this one as our bold claim, this particular pattern of misrepresentation. Okay, so this, um, this one has been um, consistently found by a substantial size of psychophysical studies. Um, and the commonly used method in this study is this perceptual matching task as illustrated here from a top-down view. So here is how it works. Um, the observer are instructed to adjust the length of this in-depth interval to match the apparent length of the frontal interval here. Um, and it is administered at different viewing distance. Okay? As you can see, as the viewing distance increases, um, this in-depth interval has to be stretched even more relative to this frontal interval to make their apparent length uh, match. Okay. Um, so here is, um, here is an unexhausted list that used this method and consistently found um, this pattern of distance-dependent um, distortion of apparent depth. And which of uh, the first of um, was done more than 100 years ago. Okay? But more recently, um, Dr. Wagner has done a, a meta-analysis of 10 such studies. Um, and as you can see, they found the same pattern. And I believe Dr. Wagner will talk more about this in his talk tomorrow. OK. Um, so far, so good. Um, but we still need to be careful before we fully accepting this results of the studies because most of the, the most of the studies use pretty simple stimuli such as this line segments, uh, cylinder, um, ellipse, and pyramid. Okay, <laughs> but according to a recent theory proposed by Zygmunt Pislow, um, uh, he claims that well, our real world objects are not that simple. Okay. So they're more complicated and contain more um, structures like bilateral symmetry and maximum compact, uh, compactness, um, such something like this polyhedron like this. So um, this theory says our visual system can use this high level of complexity and um, this regularization structures to override the distortion happened in the appearance of depth interval. Um, so as to achieve a nearly vertical representation of 3D shape. So here comes the question, is this kind of complex and well-structured shape also subject to, to, uh, subject to this distance-dependent distortion, as I mentioned earlier? Well, to, to answer this question, we conducted a psychophysical study. Okay? Um, again, we used the perceptual matching task. And in each trial, two such objects were shown side by side. And the 3D shape of this reference object on the right is fixed, whereas um, observer can um, change this 3D shape of the adjustable object, um, compress it, or um, stretch it along the depth dimension um, by moving a mouth. And here is how it looks from the observer's view um, while this left object is being adjusted. But I, bear, uh, but I bet you, you can barely see any change in its shape because um, here on this slide, um, the object were presented without stereo. 
Um, but in the real experiment, um, they will present stereoscopically and, stereoscopically and view through these 3D glasses. So participants can definitely see um, the change uh, in shape. To, to better illustrate um, this adjustment, um, I, I here I provide two more view, side view and the top view. Okay, so from here you should clearly see how, how this adjustment works. Okay, so it's the stretching and then compression only happens along the depth dimension, which is aligned with observer's line of sight. Okay, but again, only this frontal view here um, is what subjects see in the real experiments, and others are only for illustration. And um, they can be adjusted within quite a large range. Okay. Um, Remember that the goal of this experiment to test whether uh, apparent shape depending on the viewing distance. So viewing distance is our independent variable, and here is how we manipulate it. Okay, um, the adjustable object here is always presented at a fixed viewing distance; it never changed. Whereas uh, the reference object um, can have different uh, level of viewing, dis uh, viewing distances, um, three levels across trials, as you can see from this top view. Um, of our experimental configuration. And we measure their 3D shape by their um, depth to width ratio, depth to width ratio, okay? So, uh, which is um, the ratio of the extent of this object along the depth dimension to its extent along the horizontal dimension. And when the physical shape of two objects perfectly match, their depth to width ratio are the same. In other words, their relative depth to width ratio is equal to one as indicated as in this um, plot here by this dashed line here, okay? And our data show that when the two objects were presented at the same viewing distances, um, observers can achieve a nearly perfect uh, match. Um, so this group mean is not far away from this dashed line, okay? However, a, a perfect match should not be confused with the verticality. They can only suggest that the two objects are distorted by the same amount. And this claim is indeed confirmed by our data, um, as you, you see in a second, as, we, as th these objects are presented in different viewing distances, um, this perfect match um, performance no longer maintained, and observers will either overstretch or overcompress this adjustable object to make them match. So here is how it look. Uh, when we move the reference object, the thing on the right here, um, closer to the observer, well, kept everything else the same, observer will overstretch this adjustable object to make them match, okay? Um, and it implies that the nearer objects appear to have, this, appear to have more depth, okay? And similarly, when we move this reference object further away from the observer, um, they will over compress this adjustable object to make them match, which implies that the farther object appear to have less depth. And putting them together, uh, we got a pretty nice distance effect, which is consistent with what we found for the depth interval. Namely, the object appears um, increasingly compressed along its depth dimension as the viewing, viewing distance increases. Um, and our data show approximately 50% of compression as this object moved from um, 0.7 to 2.3 meters away from the observer. And note that the physical, chain, the physical shape never changed, only the parent shape. Okay. Um, in a follow-up study, uh, we make our experiment even more realistic by presenting um, the objects within the texture corridor we're sitting in depth. Um, and we let our participants do the same um, task. As you can see, the results are shown by this blue curve here, and this red curve is our original result without the corridor. Um, so it's clear that the distance effect uh, pattern maintained, okay? But another interesting finding in this follow-up study is that Although this distance effect remained the same, the overall magnitude of the, the, the adjustment shifts upward a little bit uh, when this corridor is available. Okay? So it means that 
Well, the appearance of the same object will, will, will look different only because its surrounding um, scene context has changed, whereas the physical object never changed. Okay? And similarly, we did another two experiments and found that the apparent 3D shape also depending on the object size as well as, as, well as the orientation of, of, of that object in the image plan. So putting these results together as a whole, um, it suggests that um, the, 3D uh, the 3D shape of an object, a given, given object whose, whose physical shape will never change, um, it's the, the appearance of a 3D shape uh, will change depending on several factors in the systematic pattern, okay, which is consistent with our cautious claim. Um, namely, these uh, misrepresentations of intrinsic shape are widespread. Um, but know that um, uh, th th this cautious claim is, is what motivates the uh, overall structure of our new puzzle. Um, but the specific way that we formulate our new puzzle uh, relies on um, our bold claim, which is this distance-dependent compression of apparent depth. Okay, next Alex will tell you more about this new puzzle. So, Alex. Thank you very much, Yin. So, uh, it uh, falls to me to anchor our little three-way relay. I think I have like two minutes to try to catch up. So, <laughs> let's see how that goes. Um, this is the plan for the rest of the talk. So I'm going to reformulate the puzzle to connect with the experimental data. And then I will propose a solution. And then uh, during the Q&A, you will tell me that this solution is no good. <laughs> so uh, recall the original formulation as Declan presented it uh, 15 minutes ago. It was this set of claims. And the claims are about the appearance of a single table. Now, as a psychologist, uh, it's more comfortable to work with behavioral reports of appearances. And to get at that, a very good way is to ask people to compare appearances and tell you whether they're the same or different. And so let's go to two tables now. And uh, there are these twin tables. They have exactly the same shape, exactly everything other than color. I will be referring to them as the brown and the green table. And we'll ask whether they, have the, uh, they appear to have the same shape or not. And there is this uh, tale of two tables in three acts. <laughs> Act one begins innocently enough. So two identical tables sitting at the same distance from the observer. The observer is asked, do they appear to have the same shape? The observer says, sure, they have the same shape. So far, so good. But then one of the two, let's say the green, starts receding away, let's say the, because of a conveyor belt. And as this happens, the observer attentively watches everything and is very careful to notice any apparent, apparent deformation, any non-rigid motion. And um, as um, I'm going to show data later, but in case I run out of time, uh, we have some pilot data in uh, specific studies that we run. And also, there is some experimental literature, including a nice paper by Jim Todd and colleagues, showing that um, and also everyday life appearance as we walk around it doesn't we don't uh, have experiencing we are not experiencing tables deforming in front of our eyes so the observer says sure everything is rigid nothing appears to change shape as it moves but now the plot thickens because now the green table is farther away than the brown and now we ask, OK, observer, now forget everything uh, you know about what happened before. Forget about your knowledge. Just open your eyes and kind of with a fresh look, just tell me, do these two things appear to have the same shape or not? And in our behavior experiment, we try to achieve this kind of independence by randomizing trials and by using not just two objects, but a whole lot of objects. And when you do that, um, um, we have data that indicate that the answer to this question 
will actually be no. They now have different apparent shapes. And the relevant point on the slide, uh, this is the results that Ying told us about. That now this one object, the, the brown table is at 1.5 meters, the other is at 2.3 meters. This is the point, and the important thing is it is not one. One would be the same apparent shape, and it is not the same, and so it's different. And so this is the puzzle. It was the same, it didn't appear to change shape, and yet in the end they are now different. So, um, let's reformulate this as a set of inconsistent claims. So claim one, at time one, the two tables appear to have the same shape. Claim two, they appear to have different shapes at T2. T2, by the way, corresponds to act three here. Uh, three is this principle that uh, no change in appearance without an appearance of change. And to unpack that, as a logical statement, it's a conditional. If the two tables appear to have the same shape at T1, but different shapes at T2, then at least one of them must appear to change shape between T1 and T2. But as the act two of our tale uh, indicates, as the thing is moving, uh, they appear to retain their shape. The object is rigid motion as opposed to non-rigid motion. And the fifth claim is just copied over. There are no inconsistent appearances. The problem is uh, from one, two, and three, you can infer that they must be a change. And four denies that. And so we are in trouble. Something has to give. And so now, uh, on the way to a solution, <laughs> let's examine them in turn, these five claims. Claim one seems very solid, two identical tables, identical distance, let's leave them alone. They, they have the same shape. Many people uh, reject claim two. They would deny that when the viewing distances are different, the uh, tables appear to have a different shape. But uh, we are committed to that claim because of our experimental evidence. And that is the difference, so introspectively, Few uh, philosophers were willing to go that route, but if you actually measure things carefully, then there is no hiding of that fact. So let's move on then. Uh, three will be the one that we propose to reject. So we say it is not the case that this principle holds. There can be, and indeed often is, change in appearance without an appearance of change. And to motivate this, uh, there is a large literature in psychology on change blindness. This is a sample study. It should be in color, unfortunately, because it involves the color of this basketball. And in one view, uh, it is red and black. And then there is a cut in the movie. And then now you're looking at an orange basketball. And so you have a basketball that appears to be red and black at T1 and orange in T2. And yet many uh, participants are not aware of the change. But very interestingly, then there were, in this particular study, but Angelone, Levin, and Simons, um, there was a recognition memory test afterwards. And the uh, performance was above chance about the color of the basketball. So somewhere inside their system, there was knowledge about the color of the basketball, and yet they don't, didn't notice it. So um, a standard explanation in psychology for these effects is that there are these two uh, different attentional systems, two distinct systems. This is not my topic, so I will be very brief. There is this top-down or endogenous attention. And so people can kind of look at one picture and look at the other and compare them and look for differences. And this is what uh, the participants in our study were doing when adjusting the shapes of the tables. But then there is also a bottom-up uh, attentional system, which is drawn to salient locations. And there are different ways to be salient. And one is if something is abruptly changing. And so uh, when things are blinking, they attract attention. And so change blindness demonstrations often uh, involve uh, silencing this second system. So, for example, here in the movie, there was a different cut from a different viewpoint. 
Now, this explanation doesn't work for the two table example because the person is attending and knows to look at the shape and there is no cut and nothing like that. So that solution doesn't work for our uh, puzzle, but there is this other um, solution that has a very similar uh, abstract structure. We argue there are two distinct mechanisms for detecting differences in shape. On the one hand, there is this top-down comparison. So you just look at one, look at the other, and compare. Um, and this is a synchronic uh, mechanism. They have to be present together. Or maybe one is from memory. You, remember, you pre compare the appearance of one with the memory of the other. But as you're doing these appearance, uh, comparisons, you're, they're still kind of represented side by side somehow. And there is another uh, way. And this is bottom-up diachronic mechanism based on optic flow. And these things stretch right in front of our eyes, and they could deform. And so this is something that the visual system does even with random dots and things like that. So uh, it depends on optic flow. These are some examples of different patterns of optic flow. There are things like divergence and rotation and shear. and so. On the basis of this information, the visual system apparently is doing an analysis of whether this pattern of uh, motion parallax in the optic flow can, could have originated by a rigid object. And there is this principle that the visual system uh, adopts, a rigidity assumption. If such an interpretation exists, 99% of the time the visual system will go for it. There are some exceptions, such as the Ames window and other things, but by and large. So here, the, there is just non, no structure from motion. This is a rigid structure from motion. You see this sphere spinning one way or the other. And now, this is the important thing for our case. You can literally see this thing changing shape. OK? And so um, we argue then. When, that the meaning of the phrase, the appearance of change in shape, is tied to this non-rigid motion detector mechanism. Things appear to change shape only when the non-rigid motion detector is triggered. And it is not being triggered in the puzzle cases, and that's why there is no appearance of change of shape. OK? Um, and so. Um, this is a very simple-minded kind of cartoon schematic of a, pos a proposed organization of the relevant part of the visual system. The important thing to note is there are these two pathways shown here in red and in blue. So the red pathway is this dynamic motion, uh, non-rigid motion detection. And then uh, there is another pathway that can work even if nothing is moving. So based on pictorial cues, such as perspective and stereo cues, these were the two cues available to our participants in our experiments. And there could be other cues. They are, in fact, other cues. But because there are these two distinct pathways, they can be dissociated. And one pathway can say, yes, there is a difference in appearance. And the other pathway say, no, there is no difference in appearance. And because of that, it is not the case that uh, you must have one if you have the other. Now, I do have a time to tell you an alternative. So uh, this was, notice here, the red pathway is not receiving inputs from the uh, reconstructed 3D representation of shape. It operates directly on the optic flow patterns, a very low level input. And this would be our explanation why, in the puzzle cases, there is no apparent difference in shape. Because the optic flow pattern on the retina is generated by the actual table. And the actual table is not changing shape. And so there is an object that generates a pattern that is, it is the optic flow pattern is consistent with rigidity. Now, the principle that uh, change in appearance must imply appearance of change is um, consistent with this alternative architecture in which this change of shape detector receives inputs from the internal representation. And there are many reasons to not to take this proposal very seriously. Um, 
For one, uh, you can have this non-rigid or rigid motion from random dot inputs. And what is their apparent shape when they're not moving? They're just flat dots. Um, but even if this were the case, counterfactually, we think, that kind of motion will still be invisible to this. Because the, the kind of deformation we're talking about, namely compressions along the line of sight, are, is uh, something to which this uh, non-rigid motion detector is blind. And so, to verify that, and following up to an earlier demonstration by Norman and Todd, um, so we ran a follow-up uh, in our stimuli, in our corridor. We put the objects, and they were kind of moving. And sometimes they were not; uh, they were moving rigidly, and other times they were moving while stretching by the same factor that was found in the earlier behavioral study. And we only ran the three of us last week. We need more data, but so far the three of us uh, did not detect any non-rigidity. For the amounts of distortion that were in the behavioral study. When you exaggerate the distortion by a factor of five or more, and then make it distort the wrong way, uh, then we did detect it. And so this uh, is possible. This is something the visual system could pick up, but the threshold is very high. And so it is not triggered in the kinds of uh, non veridicality we're talking about. So in conclusion, uh, one minute over time. So, um, during this simultaneous synchronous presentations, the first mechanism is engaged. During the middle part, when the things are moving, the second mechanism is engaged. And uh, this is how uh, they can get uh, contradictory results. And so, um, this uh, is uh, an evidence that uh, the visual system does not achieve full size constancy and full shape constancy. So, this diagram is what we would endorse. And then, uh, there are small but widespread and systematic failures of constancy in the visual appearance of shape. And change in appearance does not imply an appearance of change. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Um, so I've been tasked partially by the conference organizers to try to help increase the visibility of I some of our to more sit underrepresented members uh, of this field. And so as I look around, if you look around, most of the faculty here in the audience are males, particularly white males, but among the students, it's considerably more diverse. And so this is my pitch for the students in particular. Please feel emboldened to ask your questions both in this talk and in future talks and beyond to make yourself and your ideas more visible and for the other speakers and moderators to try to uh, encourage this as well. I think there's a problem in your formulation and it hinges on their definition of a shape change it strikes me as completely arbitrary. You can define shape change in numerous ways uh, and it's quite possible that observers don't necessarily even think about shape change in the same way in different contexts. So um, you take a very Euclidean approach mm. that um, shape change is Euclidean congruence, but there are other ways you could define it, and there's no reason to believe that humans um, define shape change in that manner. In fact, there's good evidence, there's lots of evidence that they don't. Okay. By formulation, do you mean this slide here, that this thing? Uh, no. Go back to the very beginning in uh, Declan's point, oh. right, that we see constancy. The question is, what constitutes constancy? Is it yeah. maintenance of Euclidean shape, or is it something else? That's a good question, Jim. We did discuss this, and there are sort of complications we'd like to put in the paper that we didn't have space for in the talk. I wasn't sure we were committed to a, a particularly Euclidean view of shape. Um, here's a very sort of simple-minded point that we had discussed. Um, an object could appear to change shape in some respects while appearing to remain constant in shape in other respects. Just as if an object changes from being light blue to dark blue, 
It's changed, it appears to change colour in some respects, in respect of light less and dark blue, but it remains blue throughout. So we're I very know, is yeah. shape is not a well-defined concept. Yes. It's a mathematical definition of shape. I see, I see. I mean, yeah. And so yeah. there are lots of things that you know, are sort of like shape. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the question is, when observers are looking at these things, what are the criteria that they use to say this is a change of shape or it's not a change in shape? I mean, without defining shape, you're, you're, you're on a really fuzzy foundation. That seems right, but we hope that we can precisify that as needed. So um, I take it to be a sort of empirical question on which we're neutral. What kind of shape properties are represented in the human visual system and how sensitive to them are we? But I think the, the, the formulation of the puzzle is meant to be flexible so that it could be reconciled with different empirical answers to that question. Um, I don't see that we need to, as it were, take a stand on the question of whether visual space is Euclidean here. You're right that with that flexibility comes a certain fuzziness, and you can gain extra precision by giving more um, mathematically rigorous definitions. Well, in your formulation, you've automatically bought into the Euclidean congruence, because in other geometries, right, I mean, squareness is irrelevant. Right, so when we move to the new class, a parallelogram. No, fair enough, fair enough, Jim. But then when we move to the new formulation that Alex presented, all that matters is whether there's an appearance of sameness or difference in shape of two tables. And so don't we have the crucial flexibility at least at that point in the puzzle? If you like, that's our kind of full dress. That's our best attempt at formulating the puzzle. Uh, in other words, I will, I will accept that we may have oversimplified slightly in our initial statement. But hopefully when we get to the comparison of two tables, these judgments about sameness and, and difference of apparent shape don't have to rest on any particular precisification of the notion of shape. Do you want to add anything? I else? would like to add, yes. Uh, there are different aspects of shape. We actually think shape is a layered concept. As you have emphasized throughout the years in our numerous conversations, there is Euclidean geometry and then affine and then projective. And so you can talk about Euclidean congruence and affine congruence and projective congruence and you can have two things being affine congruent and non-metrically congruent and so in many of the week we just didn't have time to include that in the talk the talk focuses only on metric because it is the most fragile the most vulnerable to these distortions and the important point is at least sometimes people do make those kinds of judgments and they were asked to do those kinds of judgments, metric judgments in our study and the data came back regular and, and repeatable and so forth. So it's not that they're completely blind to this thing. Um, and so those aspects of the tables like the affine shape and the fact that they're quadrilateral and all of that they, they uh, don't appear to be different, and so the puzzle doesn't arise. Uh, this is a different topic. Is that okay? Yes, that's oh, okay. good. We... You like different topics. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so, um, sorry, I was just stuck on this issue. So, I really have a clarifying question. Can you explain more this bottom up detection of rigid, rigid motion and how is di a diachronic mechanism? I just. Just okay. walk me through this a little bit more, and then I may or may not have a question. Okay, so um, the visual system is sensitive to motion on the retina. There are these uh, receptors who have a little bit of memory. Actually, can you go to the previous slide just so Here. I can see the formulation of it? Based on Octopone. Well, this is very schematic. Right, I mean, basically, my, I mean, just. To sort of say what I'm confused about, why why is the um, non -rigid rigidity here so relevant? I mean, well, because this is when things appear to change shape, like these patterns. There is this very vivid sense that there is some kind of twisting, right? And and that is changing the 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 relations between the different elements. So the distances between these dots are not conserved in, in the flow. Right, so I got all that. What I didn't see is 
that that you talked to on this slide, how that relates to the tables. Ah. But I have no sense of non-rigidity. So, well, uh, you know. So, it, it is possible to start with optical flow inputs, make some assumptions, in, and try to recover, is there a possible three-dimensional object which will generate that optic flow when it rotates in front of my eyes? And so, it is, there are algorithms that can recover three-dimensional geometry on the basis of motion parallax patterns in two dimensions. Right. But because it's about motion parallax, it is very inherently temporal thing. It is not, it, it, you, it doesn't happen if nothing is moving. This whole thing is silenced. So, is, so basically, you're operating your system for non-rigid motion detection, but you're applying it to something that to you seems completely rigid. And that's what explains what's going on? Yeah, really quickly, yeah. So the, the idea is if the table were actually deforming, that would grab your attention. The, the idea is that non-rigid motion is an attention grabber, a bit like that black spot that was appearing and disappearing. Um, so in effect, the structure of our explanation is you don't get an appearance of change in shape precisely because that non-rigid motion detector is not triggered. So your reaction is oh, the one we want. Okay. But now that the empirical question is why not? Mm. You know, after all, we claim these appearances are changing. Mm. So on many models, for example, a comparator model, you might well think an appearance of change would be generated by just noting that the appearances are different. That's the, that's if you like the structure. Of the I see. I see. I see. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, I had a a question about the use of, of the word appearance in, in the new formulation. And whether when you're, you're, there's an appearance of non-change, whether it's the same task system that's involved, or as opposed to a Grand Rudian distinction between uh, the perception of, of, the, of the different uh, shapes and then the cognitive uh, task of detecting whether the thing has changed and it could, could be a learned kind of thing. You've instead had a, you have a, uh, this, optic flow system, same kind of point, but it's a, that's a lower level system. But instead of asking that question at first, and weighing in as the third organizer, I want to see if there are any questions from graduates or postdocs that might be posed. Yes, if they're wrong, right, they can maybe be bumped up the queue. Um, if I see any, I'll call them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So if you, if, if you want to, you'll get bumped up. But just really quickly on that, Gary, yeah, so we do um, certainly have in mind um, a perceptual notion of appearance. So judgments are for us only a guide to the perceptual appearances, you know, probably the best guide we have in these behavioral experiments. But um, we're open to his uh, uh, um, subtlety that we didn't remark on that I think Carl Granrod will remark on this afternoon. Um, there are different conditions, objective conditions where your task is to say how big the object is, and apparent instructions where your job is to say how big it looks. And um, it seems that under objective instructions, there's actually a tendency towards overconstancy, which fits rather poorly with our claim that there's underconstancy and compression in depth. So we're hoping to piggyback on Carl's developmental work suggesting that under objective instructions, uh, participants tend to use cognitive strategies. That is, they're not really re reporting how things look, they're um, uh, discounting for um, known biases in the, in the visual appearances and compensating with So did you, did you have apparent instructions or did you have objective instructions or did you not have any, you weren't? I think our instructions are mostly apparent instructions. So we tell the participants to so first of all, they, they view the objects through these 3D glasses. So it's, it's a quite vivid thing <coughs> in the 3D world. So, and we tell them just to match their shape, 3D shape. And um, that's, I think that's pretty apparent um, instructions in there. So, uh, you, you get away from many of these complications by asking things to match. You just say, whatever you're doing with the left object, do the same thing with the right. Well, but so, you can match it with respect to the parent instructions or objective instructions. So I'm wondering whether in the task, um, how did you measure whether they, whether they thought there was any change in the, 
shape of the object. So I was a participant in this experiment. Did you not tell me, Alex, something like, you know, adjust until they look the same shape? I had a feeling that that was what I was up to, but maybe, maybe we didn't have this distinction as clearly in mind as, as we could have. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> the reason I look at her is because she ran everybody, and so yeah, she's the authority our, on this. Our instruction is pretty, just very straightforward. Just tell them, just match their 3D shape, and they just got it. They don't feel confused or ambiguous in this instruction. And second, um, as I said, their view of this 3D thing, so it's pretty vivid. And third, um, so our two objects being compared in one trial, they have different sizes and different colors. So we, we, we designed that way to, to get rid of some retinal matching thing. So after they've done their match, are they supposed to push a button if they detect the change in shape or something like that? Detect a change in shape? They click the mouse. You still yeah, that's right. It's, a, it's mouse an adjustment task. So when you drag the mouse around, uh, it is changing right in front of your eyes, and, and then you stop dragging the mouse when it kind of looks that they're the same shape, and then you fine-tune it a little bit more, and then you click, and, and the computer records it. So that's measuring the, the, the change in appearance, but how are you measuring the appearance of change? Oh, that was a separate thing. That's the pilot study you did. So the original experiment didn't measure that, right? No. The appearance of change was, was something that came to us later. We're like, well, it's rather puzzling. If the appearances are changing, why is there no appearance of change? And then we thought, we'd better measure that. And so the pilot study was the, the object moving down the corridor. This is a really interesting line of question, Gary. I just want to make one final point, which is that even if we weren't as careful as we could have been about this distinction between objective and apparent instructions. It's not really bad news for us if there's under constancy under either set of conditions. Well, but sure. appearance of change is a separate question and they could have thought of this as a different kind of task and I so see. forth. So that's, uh, I, I anyway, we can talk know. about it at lunch or dinner. So, uh, sorry. No, 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 let's move on. <laughs> okay, so I, I have two quick questions. One is that, do you, is this a prediction of your view that if we do an experiment in which the object actually is not rigid, say if I'm blowing a balloon as I'm moving farther away from you, so it is changing in shape, and it's going to, uh, that in that situation, because the mechanism that is sensitive to rigidity assumption does not kick in, we're not going to get a puzzle. My intuitive prediction is that we're going to get a puzzle, but it's going to be a little bit different from the, the new puzzle, maybe the, it's a new star puzzle, which is, we're going to perceive the, the object to change in size to, in some degree that will not match the, our judgments about how different in size the two objects are if they are, if they are compared, the end results are compared. So we're going to get a similar puzzle even if we run it with a situation where the object is not rigid. Uh, and if that is the case, that might be a reason to reject your explanation unless, you know, it is not an implication of your view that the mechanism cannot kick in when the objects are not rigid. So, but, and if, if there is a, that's a reason to reject your view, then here's an alternative explanation that is very simple, which is there is an appearance of change, but we don't notice it. <coughs> what, why is that a bad explanation? Well... For me, this is just an oxymoron. How <laughs> appearance of change, but we didn't notice. So, in what sense is it there an appearance then? Well, you know, the, some of the examples I I I I am with you in the. So, can you give that again? I didn't track that. So, you're inflating this balloon and you're walking backwards, <laughs> and and so I see it inflating. Yeah. So it's okay. not an object. Okay. And you're, I. I do this experiment. I ask you, what is the degree to which this object is changing in size as I'm moving backward, right? And then we get the result for that. And then I also ask you, after it has been done, to compare the size of object before the movement with this. My prediction is that you're going to get two different replies. Yes, most but likely. A, a appearance of change is not going to match in that case. The degree of appearance of change is not going to match the degree of difference in size. 
Uh, so you will get a similar puzzle, but it, your mechanism cannot explain it because the, the mechanism that depends, it's, it's uh, triggering depends on the assumption of rigidity cannot be triggered here because the balloon is not rigid. So, but now you, that's a different question. The question is no longer did anything change? It's now, yes, we all agree it did change, but by how much? Yeah, the, the, and, the and then, then uh, I guess the basic pattern still holds. It, it is, I agree, it's not exactly the same. But the basic explanation is there are these two pathways and they kind of interact. So once it starts moving, it also feeds in. It contributes to the apparent change of the thing. This is how you can get shape from motion in the absence of any other cues. But, and so there is this question of cue combination. So, and things are combined in different proportions, in different contexts. And so it could be in one case a little over and in another case a little under. But the basic thing is because there are two separate pathways, you can get all kinds of interesting discrepancies. So would it be correct to say when you say in that box non-rigid motion detection, I shouldn't interpret that strictly as meaning it's a detection mechanism that only gets triggered when we have no. Oh yes, motion. yes. So I shouldn't read that. And as that there, kind of there is a second line there. If you go back, I know. Okay, so. Wait, three so D structure from motion, and so it involves how big it is, and so I had this one slide that I very regretfully had to cut, but this. Optic flow is a function of two things. One is the intrinsic properties of the object. So when your balloon really is changing size, that is part of it. And the other is about the relation to the eyeball. And they kind of get mixed in the optical projection. The visual system tries to invert that and delivers representations of both components. And so some of it is about the intrinsic and some of it is about how far away it is and so forth. And so there, it is not just one, one bit of information, boom, it changed, or no, it didn't. It is much more detailed than that. Really quick on the other part of your question, Farid, I might be a bit more sympathetic than Alex to the idea that there's really a stark distinction between questions about what's in the appearance and what you notice. For example, I don't think I have much sympathy with this, Alex, but I am open to the idea that in the gorilla example, the inattentional blindness cases, there might be an appearance of the gorilla without, uh, without you noticing the gorilla. Well, the stock examples that philosophers use to motivate that is that like when you're driving, there is a lot of change in appearance, but you, most of them you don't notice because, you know, and it's hard to, it would be, from that point of view, That's kind right. of to say that there is no change in appearance. So oh, I guess, no yeah, thanks for that, Tori. Just two quick comments about that. So one is that I'm just a little nervous because when you start to posit that discrepancy, there's a lot of maneuver for yep. putting lots in the appearances that we never notice. But I think more particularly what bothers me about that is that in these um, cases of movement, no matter how hard you focus, no matter how hard you attend, you still don't, you still don't notice any change in shape. Uh, and that's borne out by this private study we ran where the three of us were trying very hard to detect uh, you know, any kind of non-rigid motion and, and we simply couldn't. But that is a good question. Yeah, I would like to, to uh, question the entire premise of the puzzle. <laughs> yes, and, go for it. Uh, so is it possible that the puzzle arises from the fact that humans are really very special, that they have two levels? The level of perception are things the same, and the level of meta perception, uh, do I perceive things as they're the same? So these two quest two levels can be incompatible, and uh, so it seems that in your experiment, subjects may be confused too. So uh, my question is this: If this is the case, imagine that you take organisms. Where you, that do not have level two, that have only level one. Uh, anybody from babies to rats to pigeons, and all they need to do is to peck or to respond in some way when things are the same, not perceived as being the same. Do you expect this puzzle to arise? Uh, 
I think I can do the tale of two cities, uh, two tables, excuse me, um, with pigeons. So they, they ought to, it's, it ought to be possible to train them separately yeah. to do one and so the other. Back on the same shape. So, pack if there's the same yeah. pack here and if they're not the same pack somewhere else to get food, yes. that's one condition and another condition Pack if you see non-rigid motion and or don't pack. I think you can do this with any animal that, that has non-rigid motion perception of any kind. Um, and I have, we, we kept saying you have to actually do the measurement because you cannot trust your intuitions on these things. The question is what will happen in act three? Will they pack as if they're the same or as if they're different. And I have no doubt that they will pack that they're the same. Well, that surprises me because, I mean, of course, we'll, we'll have to look at the data on this, but I thought both that there's substantial empirical evidence of perceptual constancies in animals. It's not as if perceptual constancy is a distinctly human phenomenon. But secondly, it would be extremely surprising if the substantial evidence of under-constancy in the human visual system was some distinctively human phenomenon. You'd think that under-constancy was a phenomenon of animal perception too. So I would just be very surprised, based on, on those sort of high-level theoretical claims, if there wasn't some analogue of um, the phenomenon we're alluding to that could be experimentally tested in animals. Of course, if that's not to give you direct experimental evidence. And if I may add... One more, because you mentioned metacognition, there is an interesting meta aspect of this, which is people walk around and they believe, they trust their eyes, they believe they have full shape constancy, full shape uh, size constancy, and so the table didn't change because, and didn't appear to change because I have veridical perception and it, it is made of wood and thing, wooden things don't change, and so, so, there are these errors, two, meta, two false beliefs that lead to a correct conclusion. False belief number one, my visual system achieves shape and size constancy. This is false, but people believe it. And then um, the second belief is an appearance of change, a, a change in appearance implies appearance of change. In other words, if it really did change shape, I would have seen it because my visual system is veridical. And so if there is really a change, I would have seen it. it I'm not change blind. I, and so people are surprised by the gorilla demo, by the, all of that. These are surprising. But so in our case, there is this failure of constancy. And then there is this, it is not true that you, you, something may change and, and uh, you have to notice. It, changes can go unnoticed, but the two errors cancel out and you end up with a true belief. Namely, the table did move as a rigid body without changing in shape. So, um, it's just about noon. Are you guys, one more quick question? Or? Yeah, if we make it quick, we'll probably be okay. I can ask you. Right, I'll try to be quick. So, um, I think you guys are, this is a great, you're onto something here, right? And the, what's really critical, the critical observation is there really is a task difference. Right, so in the first case, experiment one, it's the same difference task, right? And in the other case, it's really a constancy task, right? Is this the same object or has it changed? And those are really different tasks. And there's a history in the literature of finding that even people looking at the same object and doing different tasks to judge its shape come up with different shape results, right? And so you may, I, I, may, I think you may have not have quite the right mechanism. But, but consider the possibility that when you're doing the same different side-by-side -side task, you're really attending to the metric properties of those mm -hmm. two objects. When you're doing a constancy task, you're ignoring those metric properties because objects, it's an affine task, right? Because as we walk around the world, in order for things not to deform all the time, we have to, we have to be in an affine class of shapes. That reminds me of this rigidity assumption. So the visuals, so if we go back to this slide maybe that I didn't show, but so there is an awful lot of change in the retinal image 
it changes all the time for the wrong reasons. There is self-motion, there is rigid motion, and so the visual system tries desperately to get to the intrinsic object property, and so any change that can be accounted for in any other way, it is willing to, to say, okay. Um, and so uh, I, that resonates with what you're saying. These metric properties are the ones that will be changing the most. And then there are these non-accidental properties such as parallelism and so forth, and, and they pertain to affine geometry and projective. And so th there is, this is why the metric changes the most, the topological changes the least. And so I guess I'm in agreement uh, with, the, with the basic direction you are, you are pointing. But people can attend to metrics. Sometimes it is important. And uh, then, so it's not something they're completely blind to. It's not something that is completely discarded. It is there, but it is less salient. Yes, I can I make just a quick announcement about lunch? So, um, on your own, um, there are lots of options on the high street, but there are three options if you'd like.